All right, we're continuing our pledge drive. If you haven't already, please become a patron of the podcast at patreon.com. You might have to actually have to go to your computer and log on to patreon.com and become a patron. Become a part of the fold, people. Become a part of our community and get access to exclusive episodes and get invited to our podcast parties, either on Skype or whatever. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am chair of the Couple and Family Therapy Program at Antioch University, Seattle, and I'm also a psychotherapist. Today, I thought I would just read an email here from patron Jen in Portland. She emailed, I think, yesterday. In her email, she writes how she is trained as a counselor, but because of having uh, a child and moving and family uh, obligations, she can't practice as a therapist. And so she is saying that uh, the, the podcast is helpful for her because it keeps her connected to the field, with, even though she's not currently working in the field. But uh, I think she wants to go back to the field. So... Hopefully you can start seeing clients and, and making a difference in the world, patron Jen from Portland. Uh, and then she goes on to say, after having a baby, I've come to realize the reality of some mental health struggles that new mothers face. Postpartum depression is the obvious term we usually hear, but aside from that, new mothers often face complex emotional and social shifts as they adjust to motherhood. I've spent many days getting to know other moms, and one thing that has stood out to me is the shame and loneliness that we all feel. New mothers feel pressure, whether it is pressure they put on themselves or pressure they feel from partners or by family or by society, to be the perfect mom. We silently compare ourselves to our babies, whether it be about who is hitting milestones first or which parenting style one adheres to, etc., Many mothers struggle to find the support they need, whether it be due to a lack of resources in their area, illness, shame, isolation, etc., or all the above. I have experienced this firsthand, and even though I never had postpartum depression, I could definitely understand how these other factors could contribute to and worsen a new mother's mental health. I feel as though I have only hit the top of the iceberg here, and I could go on and on. I'm wondering if you could spend some time highlighting the needs of new mothers and offer your insight on ways therapists can help support them and their families. Peace and warm wishes, patron Jen from Portland. Well, this is a very excellent email, patron Jen. Well, let's go to, before I rant about, (laughs) as I'm guessing if you know the podcast, you know I'm going to rant at some point, but... I thought I would just read some random research. Uh, I just did a quick search on some research on postpartum depression, and I thought I would just review that real quick. The first article that I found is by Phillips et al., and it's titled, The Influence of Psychological Factors on Postpartum Weight Retention at Nine Months. It's published in the British Journal of Health Psychology, 2014. And it starts off by saying, Postpartum weight retention is an increasing health problem for women who have had a child and has a range of negative health implications for both mothers and offspring. So they're, they're studying how women will gain, will, will retain the weight that they gained during pregnancy and how there's a, there's a lot of health problems for, for both women and the children. It also says here that weight retention at 12 months postpartum is a critical pathway for longer-term overweight and obesity and is a better predictor of longer-term weight retention than than gestational weight gain alone. So in other words, just looking at the weight that a woman gains during pregnancy isn't a very good indicator of long-term weight gain. What is an indicator is whether or not the person has retained the weight a year after giving birth. And they go on to say, therefore, increasing our understanding of the factors that contribute to and maintain postpartum weight, postpartum weight retention throughout the first 12 months post-birth is required to devise intervention and prevention strategies that specifically target 
a return to pre-pregnancy weight within the first year. So in other words, it's, we need to study what are the factors that contribute to people retaining the weight for a year. And we need to target those factors with interventions so that we can help women to be healthy. Then they go on to identify factors that lead to weight gain for postpartum women. And it says that uh, one of the factors is the body mass index of the woman uh, before getting pregnant. So I'm guessing the, the higher the BMI pr prior to pregnancy, the, the easier it is to gain weight after pregnancy. Also poor sleep quality, it's pretty obvious. Also, medical complications during pregnancy. So if there are complications, there are, is more likelihood of gaining weight after pregnancy. And also, surprisingly, cesarean mode of delivery. So if, if you have a cesarean uh, delivery, then that contributes to weight gain. I don't see how that would be uh, possible, but apparently that is. Demographic and socio-contextual influences include low social support, which makes sense. Higher maternal age, being older than 30 years or being younger than 23 years at first childbirth. So that's interesting. So if you're older than 30 or younger than 23 at your first childbirth, then you're more likely to gain weight after, after uh, pregnancy. It's weird. And low socioeconomic status. So if you are low socioeconomic status, you're more likely to retain the weight after, after birth. And they say behavioral factors include breastfeeding for shorter durations. That's interesting. So if you, if you breastfeed for shorter durations, then that's somehow correlated with greater weight retention after, after pregnancy. Also poor dietary quality, that's pretty obvious and low levels of physical activity, which is also pretty obvious. <laughs> so big surprise, if after giving birth you don't eat well and you don't exercise, you retain your weight. <laughs> also, previous research has found that the influence of such psychological things, such as depression and stress and body satisfaction, also play a significant role in women's postpartum weight gain and that some researchers are starting to look in these areas rather than the other areas. And the, the results of their study uh, found that previous results were, uh, they confirmed previous results that the weight one gains during pregnancy will predict longer term weight gain. And they also found evidence that longer durations of breastfeeding can result in lower uh, weight gain after after pregnancy, which is interesting. So if you if you breastfeed for longer durations, then that's correlated with less weight gain uh, twelve months later after after pregnancy. But the pro perhaps the most interesting, perhaps to you guys out there, being psychologically minded people, the 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 most interesting finding of this study was the following. Body dissatisfaction during postpartum appears to play a key role in influencing weight gain past a year. With women with increased postpartum body dissatisfaction at both, at both three and six months postpartum retaining more weight. In other words, so you, say you have 100 women and 50 of them at three months after after giving birth, even though they have still retained some of the weight, they don't have self-esteem issues or body dissatisfaction issues. They're they're looking at their bodies and they're thinking, yeah, okay, I'm I still haven't gotten back to my original weight, but but you know, a lot of women are like that three months after after giving birth and I still love myself and my partner still loves me and I'm still a good person. Okay, so you take 50 people like that and you take another 50 people and after giving birth at three months, they have normal weight retention and they have a lot of body dissatisfaction, a lot of uh, 
guilt and shame and and self-esteem issues. Perhaps they're not getting support from those around them regarding their body image. Well, the second group of people are much more likely to retain their weight after 12 months than the group of people that don't have body image issues three, three months and six months after, after giving birth. So even though their weight might be the same in terms of their weight gain, the, the, the way that they view it, the meaning that they derive from their weight gain three, three to six months after giving birth is a key factor in whether or not they retain that weight, which is perhaps counter to what a lot of people would think. You would think that if someone was satisfied with their body, that they, that they would stay overweight. You know, if you have a woman three months after giving birth and she's like, yeah, sure, I've gained weight, but that's normal. You would say, oh, that's, that's a problem because she's going to retain that weight. But it's actually the reverse of that. The more a person is shaming themselves for gaining weight after giving birth, the more likely they are to retain that weight. And again, it's counterintuitive to a lot of people, but the reasoning, the speculation is, and I've thought a lot about this myself with my own clients, is that the more you shame yourself, the more likely you need to turn to things to feel better. And one of the things that people turn to to feel better is to eat. And so shaming yourself for your body has this strange reverse effect of actually making it difficult to lose weight. Okay, so that's that article. Here's another one written by Dennis et al. titled The Relationship Between Maternal Self-Esteem, Maternal Competence, Infant Temperament, and Postpartum Blues, uh, published in the Journal of Reproductive and Infant Psychology, September 2012 starts out by saying, while pregnancy and birth are largely physiological experiences, they also represent psychological stress, which can lead to vulnerability in the mother. In the days following birth, it has been shown that a large number of women manifest postpartum blues, essentially characterized by an incessant crying with or without sadness, mood swings, and moderate cognitive difficulties. So their study found the following. Correlation analyses showed a link between postpartum blues intensity and low maternal self-esteem. Also, an impression of lacking competence in caretaking and feeding abilities, and also the perception of the infant as difficult. So in other words, that postpartum blues, but they're calling postpartum blues, I'm guessing they're, that's a label used for subclinical depression or something. So the intensity of postpartum blues is influenced by the perception of the infant as difficult. So whether or not the infant is difficult or not is not necessarily relevant. What is relevant is whether or not a a new mother has the perception that their infant is difficult. This will lead to greater intensity of postpartum blues. So this has a lot of implications for education of new mothers and support of new mothers. We can imagine that if a mother is not getting any support, then they are likely to f- perceive that their infant is quote unquote difficult. Also, if they're getting a lot of judgment from other people and not a lot of normalization, they might think, oh, there's something wrong with me that my infant is difficult, I must be doing something wrong, and that would lead to postpartum blues. I find that a lot of these uh, articles don't highlight that, so, that cultural issue. They're, they're, they sort of dance around it or something in terms of you know what the listener was saying in terms of the support of people around them. It, it, they, you know, uh, for whatever reason psychology, and this is a global issue, you know, a a widespread issue in psychology that they tend to ignore social factors. They they tend to look toward um, um, either individual psychological issues or biological issues instead of social issues. Anyway, here's another study by Letourneau titled, Identifying the Support Needs of Fathers Affected by Postpartum Depression, a pilot study 
published in 2011 in the Journal of Psychiatric and Mental Health Nursing. It says here that the purpose of this pilot study was to describe the experiences, support needs, resources, and barriers to support for fathers whose partners had experienced postpartum depression. They conducted telephone interviews with 11 fathers from New, New Brunswick and Alberta. It says here, the fathers we spoke with experienced a number of depressive, depressive symptoms, including anxiety, lack of time and energy, irritability, feeling sad or down, changes in appetite, and thoughts of harm to self or the baby. The most common barriers to ex accessing support, including not knowing where to look for postpartum depression resources and difficulty reaching out to others. And they conclude here by saying, the study demonstrated the feasibility of a larger scale exploration of fathers' experiences in supporting their spouses affected by postpartum depression. So not to veer away from the women's experience too, too much, but just to dip into this a little bit, is that fathers are also affected by this. And they are often anxious, they're irritable, they're sad, they're having uh, problems with their appetite, eating too much, eating too little. And they're also having thoughts of harming themselves and also having thoughts of harming their baby, which is quite concerning. <laughs> so it's just something to think about. The study in their introduction talks about the factors that contribute to postpartum depression, including low self-esteem, inability to cope, feelings of incompetence, and uh, feelings of loneliness. So uh, again, if we isolate mothers and families and we tell them that they're no good, or we give them that impression, or we don't tell them that they're doing well, then this leads to an increase in, in postpartum depression. And I just found a typo in this, in this article. That's funny. Here's another article by O. Mahoney and Donnelly in 2010 in the Journal of Psychiatric and Mental Health Nursing titled Immigrant and Refugee Women's Postpartum Depression Help Seeking Experiences and Access to Care, a Review and Analysis of the Literature. Basically, this article is, uh, or this research is looking into how literature on postpartum depression is published and uh, is accessible to immigrants and refugees and how that might be improved. And, and uh, it's finding that there's a lot of issues with access and with it being in other people's languages so that immigrants and refugees uh, can benefit from literature and education regarding postpartum depression. So there's other articles here that I could read, but I'm running out of time. The, the main thing that I, I will say is, is exactly what the patron was talking about in terms of our society is ever increasing its judgment on parents. There was a time in our society, and if you're old enough, like me, 45 or older, you can remember this time, when parents didn't judge other parents very much. They certainly did, I mean, you know, judge people. People are naturally judgy. But they didn't judge other parents nearly as much as they do today. If you have a child that is doing something distasteful, the, the first thought that people have is to blame the parents. And in, in a way that is very pressuring to parents, and parents really feel it. And not only just distasteful, you know, because there's, you know, you're at the grocery store. If you're a parent, you've, you've, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're at the grocery store, and one of your kids is having a tantrum of some kind, <laughs> having a meltdown. And it's incredibly embarrassing when it shouldn't be embarrassing. If, if your kid has a meltdown at the grocery store, you should feel supported by society because it's normal for kids to have meltdowns, particularly in the grocery store. The grocery store is no fun for kids. And they see candy and they know they can get away with things because they're in public. And there's all sorts of 
you know, attractive nuisances in a grocery store. And so it's normal for kids to have meltdowns in public. And for a parent to feel embarrassed and unsupported and judged is the opposite of what it should feel. Most of the people in the grocery store have had children and know what it's like. And yet people feel judged. Imagine this, uh, a father, single father is wheeling his three daughters down the cereal aisle and one by one, the children start to have a meltdown. And imagine other parents coming and saying, oh, can I help? <laughs> is there, oh, I've been there before. And certainly this happens. Certainly there are parents that are wise enough to say things like this in public and, and to, you know, give a little nod to the parents. Say, I know, I feel your pain. <laughs> you know, there's certainly that kind of stuff. But we live in a society where either parents are, other people around are either neutral or very judgy. Most parents, particularly of children that are, quote unquote, you know, prone to meltdowns, will have multiple stories of people coming up to them in public and chastising them. I know many parents have come to me and, and said, yeah, I was, I was at the grocery store, my kid had a meltdown, and, and I was not coping well, <laughs> and I was being stern with my kid. And as I was leaving the grocery store, this woman came up to me and told me that I was a terrible parent. And I just think this is a travesty. It's terrible. So not only those kinds of situations, but also when you have play dates and you get together with other parents or you're at school and you're in the first grade and, and your kid is, is just average. So that's, that's, another, that's another whole other thing is the pressure we put on not only children, but also parents of children to produce above average children. <laughs> I mean, imagine a, a, you know, a, a mother and a father with a bumper sticker that said, my kid is average. <laughs> my kid gets average grades. My kid is an average soccer player. No one wants an average kid. Everyone wants an above average kid and wants that kid to be the top of their class. And I mean, I'm exaggerating, not everybody, but most people want that. Not everyone can be the top of their class. Not everyone can be above average by definition. There, need, there needs to be a good number of people that will be just average and a good number of people that will be, and half the people will be below average. So it, it, it's a lot of pressure to, to put on everybody to produce uh, you know, these, these little geniuses. And you'll see a lot of efforts, particularly in middle class, upper middle class families, to start their children at the age of, of two or younger on certain tasks uh, that are supposed to be preparatory for college and, and medical school. And if, you know, as a parent, if, if you want to go in that direction, it's fine. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. But what the, it's been growing and growing in our society, and it's, and it's only getting worse. There doesn't seem to be any movement to push back on this, this notion. I think what our society is doing is they're, they're mistaking uh, a, a correlation between helicopter parenting and you know tons of effort in trying to produce genius children. They're they're mistaking a correlation between that and raising good kid, raising good children. I think that people when when they see you know say for instance uh, you have a kid who is just doing you know average in school. And the parents don't pay a ton of attention to his or her life, uh, but the parents love their children and are there for them and are helping them with the, their emotions and are modeling good relationships. But they're not super interested in how much they're excelling in the second grade. Well, what the outside world will perceive that family is neglecting their children even though you could take another family and have the parents spending all their time helping their second grader with their homework and going to every single meeting at school and, and getting tutors and getting instructors for dance and getting, and getting people to help them with their you know, motor, psychomotor movement. And yet those parents could possibly be neglecting those children emotionally. And so there's this, there's this perception that 
if you're spending all this time, then you're being a good parent. But that's not necessarily true. The kinds of things that children need are much different than, than them doing well in school. And, and I see this all the time with parents, and I've been seeing this for the last 20 years, but it's getting worse and worse. The, the primary reason why parents will bring in their children to see me is because they're getting bad grades. Just think about that for a second. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a family therapist. I, I see a lot of children and, and their parents. Just think about this. The primary reason why people will bring their children in to see me is because their grades have been slipping. Not that their self-esteem is suffering. Not that there's conflict in the family. Not that they're, they are wondering if their parenting skills are up to the task. Not that they feel disconnected from their children. Not that their children are seemingly disconnected from society. None of those things are the, are the, certainly those are reasons why people bring in their children, but the primary reason is because their grades are slipping. And what I find is that as soon, when I work with these families and I identify problems, I'm like, okay, sure there's grades, but there's all these other emotional issues and, and system issues. And I start addressing everything. If the grades get better and nothing else gets better, some parents will pull their children out of therapy and say, okay, we're done. We've met our goal. The kid has, has raised their grades. And this is, this is an epidemic. This is a problem in our society. And it's, it's creating kids who are lonely and who are having difficulty socializing because when you inundate kids with all of this academic pressure and tutoring and homework and all this stuff, something's got to give. And what, what, what gets sacrificed is socializing, learning how to have fun, being free, <laughs> letting them just run amok. Children need to run amok. You know, they need to have freedom. They need to explore. They need to have free uh, socializing time with, with other people. They need, and again, they need to have fun. And what you end up having is a lot of kids that increasingly feel disconnected and incompetent socially. And what do they do? They turn to video games because video games re don't require much nuance and understanding of, of how to socialize. It's very easy to play video games w without being very adept socially. And plus, the video games are perfectly designed to entice people. So, I don't know, I'm sort of ranting, but... My, my primary thesis here is we need to all do our part to change the social construction regarding parenting, and we need to support other parents. We need to understand them. We need to have compassion. We need to stop judging them. We need to reach out to them and not isolate them. We need to understand that new mothers and new fathers are struggling and need support and need understanding and are likely very thirsty for a kind word and for help. And if we can do that, we can reduce the effects of postpartum issues, we can help them with their parenting, and we can help uh, children develop better because when parents are happy, then children are happy. All right, patron Jen from Portland, I hope that that uh, addresses your question. Thanks for writing in, and thank you for listening out there. That does it for another episode of Psychology in Seattle. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it.